Um, and yeah, firstly, I should say, so firstly, welcome. We probably say that first, to be honest. <laughs> um, and we've had a lot of bookings today, actually, which is really good. So I think there's a real keen interest in cooperatives and how cooperatives fit in as part of the wider social enterprise movement. Um, we do have a lot of speakers today, actually. It's probably my fault, but I thought there was quite a lot of um, interesting voices out there in terms of the cooperative movement, support organizations and grassroots social enterprises. So I think it's important to kind of hear all those all those different types of voices. Um, and then obviously after the speakers have spoken, we'll just go to the general discussion. So we're keen on hearing your views about cooperatives and where we're at just now, how cooperatives fit into the wider social enterprise movement, um, support needs, that kind of thing. Um, whether you're in a cooperative yourself or you're just interested in the cooperative topic or the business model. Um, so please do post your questions in the chat at any time. And when we come to questions, obviously you can put your hand up and just speak if you want to as well. So I'd like to introduce uh, Nathan Tamblin as our first speaker uh, from the UK Law Commission, um, looking at the review of the cooperative model. Sorry, that's a very bad description. I'm sure Nathan can explain it better than I can. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nathan. I'm from the Law Commission of England and Wales. We were created by statute to keep the law under review and suggest reform where needed. We are an arm's length body, so we reach our decisions independently. Our only goal is to make the law as good as it can be. We've been asked by HM Treasury to review the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act 2014. Uh, this act obviously extends to Scotland, England and Wales. Uh, we suspect that any reforms um, that are going to benefit co-ops and community benefit societies will benefit them wherever they are, whether in Scotland, England or Wales. But if anybody thinks there are uh, characteristics unique to Scotland, then we would love to hear from you. Um, you can drop us an email. Our email address is coops at lawcommission.gov.uk. I will stick that in the chat as well. Uh, you can also email us there um, if you want to go on our mailing list uh, to get updates on our work. So this project, Reviewing the Act, it began in earnest in September. We have spoken with a wide range of stakeholders informally to hear from them what reforms they think are needed. We are now in the process of writing up our consultation paper. The consultation paper will set out all the options for reform that we've identified or which have been suggested to us, discuss each one, make some provisional proposals, and then ask consultees what they think. Uh, the consultation period will be open for 12 weeks. Which is, uh, we're not expecting to publish the consultation paper until the summer. But once we do, it will then be open for 12 weeks. Our provisional uh, proposals in the consultation paper are genuinely provisional. They can and do change depending on what consultees tell us. At the moment, there are about 80 issues in there that we're discussing, which sounds like a lot. Well, it is quite a lot. Um, but that's because this is the first time in about 100 years that we've been able to review uh, um, society legislation all the way through. You don't have to answer questions on all of those issues, you can just answer the ones that interest you. Um, but there is no issue too small for us to consider because this will be the only opportunity to do so, uh, probably for the next hundred years. I would say that there are three headline issues at the moment though. Those are, do we need a definition of a co-op and if so what? Do we need a definition of a community benefit society? And if so, what? And do we need to overhaul the law relating to society shares? If any of that sounds interesting to you or you've got anything else you want to share with us, drop me a line. Uh, I think that's it for me for now. So I was just trying to find my unmute button there. Thank you, Nathan. That's really, really important, actually, I think, that review. So if anybody... Yeah, does have any views on the on the review please do get in contact with nathan his email address is in the chat just now um so i don't think james is with us yet has he there's a few people just connecting actually um but uh yeah stuart mcgregor if you want to go next from cooperative development scotland to talk about um what cds does no worries thanks uh thanks duncan we're just going to share my screen um i have to have slides because I tend to go off piste a little bit if I don't have something to keep me right. Uh, my name's Stuart McGregor. I work for Cooperative Development Scotland, which is part of Scottish Enterprise. Um, so a little bit of background to me. I used to used to work in social enterprise sector as an advisor, um, and then lastly as a funding manager for a, a 
major philanthropic grant funder in Scotland as well. Um, and I joined CDS just over a year and a half ago um, because a lot of the work we were involved in was around uh, alleviating poverty and trauma and actually, you know, getting closer to um, inclusive business models and democratic ownership was really important um, to me personally. And, and actually CDS hits that that nice sweet spot. So I'm just going to cover very, very briefly um, who we are. Um, we're, we're part of the inclusive models team within Scottish Enterprise and we act on behalf of all of Scotland's enterprise agencies. So not only Scottish Enterprise, but Highlands and Islands Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise. So we provide support to companies and community groups who want to adopt employ ownership or cooperative business models. Um, and you know we contribute quite significantly to the plural ownership pillar of community wealth building by supporting those companies and community groups who want to adopt those types of business models so we've got lots of support including practical support around uh, cooperative models we do lots of market building and knowledge skills and education work we've we've recently recently concluded a community wealth building engagement program with local authorities and um, tsi staff and we also have a, a policy and strategy remit for social enterprise as well so I thought I'd just cover very quickly, um, you know, we were described as the inclusive models team with NSE and our, our work contributes to that plural ownership pillar of community wealth building, sometimes known as in inclusive ownership. And the inclus an inclusive business model basically tries to achieve greater equality through positive societal impact, fairer profit distribution, and shared and democratic ownership to ensure everybody within the organization has a voice. So there are three key models widely attributed to inclusive business models. Those are on the screen just now, cooperatives, employee ownership, and social enterprise. And the majority of employee-owned companies are, are generally profitable commercial businesses. The key difference is who their shareholders are, which are the employees. Cooperatives are often formed to meet the, the economic needs of, of their members, such as providing goods and services at a fair price, whereas Social enterprise, on the other hand, generally will have a, a broader social or environmental mission that goes beyond serving the immediate needs of, of their members. So the key differences between each model generally lie in ownership structure, profit share, and distribution as well. So you can see the kind of key distinctions that, that start to, to emerge. Social enterprises, on the other hand, reinvest profits into their social social mission. So within CDS, as the inclusive business model team, we have we've got that remit to support co-ops, um, employee ownership succession, um, planning, and also the the remit around social enterprise policy. So it's probably worth highlighting that there are some instances where an organisation can be both charitable and and a cooperative. However. The key differences lie in their ownership structures, governance models, decision-making process, and profit distribution practices. So I wasn't sure how, how much to cover in the, the, the five or six minutes I have, but basically just to, to uh, reaffirm, you know, that co-ops come in all shapes and sizes. And, um, you know, we've seen cooperative pubs, energy suppliers, taxi firms, bookstores, community gardens, distilleries, um, you know, there's housing co-ops, healthcare co-ops, um, uh, platform co-ops. And in Scotland, you know, we'll be fairly familiar with uh, credit unions, I guess, a popular model of non-profit cooperative business that have got a really long history in Scotland. So I personally feel that there's a cooperative model for all, all business ventures. Just to highlight some of the key, key ingredients for cooperatives that, you know, their, their businesses are owned and controlled by their members using that kind of defined rights of participation through one member, one vote system and um, the primary purpose of a co-op is to meet the needs of those members and the members can be customers employees residents or suppliers so all are receiving a direct benefit from being a member and have a say in how the co-ops run so start to understand that the co-ops co-ops are about the how rather than the what they also come in a variety of different legal forms and um, you know essentially it's the members that the benefit from the co-op so sometimes co-ops can be charitable as the member benefit doesn't always have to be directly financial in the form of a dividend and um, the purpose of a co-op is to ensure the financial interests of its members so the primary aim of a cooperative is not necessarily to yield profit but rather to directly satisfy the needs of members and the member benefit doesn't always have to be financial in the form of a, a dividend as well just a very quick slide, sorry, I know I'm rushing through this, a very quick slide um, on some of the data, and we're lucky to have a fantastic data set uh, collated by Co-ops UK. We've got some really useful data that gives us a sense of the size and scale of co-op sector in the UK and 
Scotland and the sector's contribution to the economy, contributing over 40 billion to the UK economy. But, you know, I think in Scotland, I still describe it um, as a, a bit of a hidden uh, business model. Um, also, the really resilient data shows that 83% of new start co-ops survive their first five years compared to 38% of other businesses. You know, they're seriously resilient in terms of a business model and there's so much potential for us within CDS to help guide businesses towards a, a fairer, more democratic um, model of, of doing business. So just again, covering what we can offer within CDS, we've got a support offer for new and existing co-ops. We generally offer a starting point of around two and a half days of fully funded support from our specialist call-off framework um, that provide advice, um, looking at a cooperative model, whether it's right for you, what the legal structure might be, provide direct advice on membership roles and responsibilities. And um, we can also look at things like financial planning, securing funding, uh, and looking at newer various partnership approaches approaches that, that, that you might want to take forward. And finally, contact details there for me um, within Scottish Enterprise. We're also on LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow us on Corporate Development Scotland or on X at CDS Scotland and my uh, Twitter account as well. So sorry, that was a really quick whistle stop um, tour. And Duncan, I think you've got the PDF of my presentation. So happy if, happy if you want to circulate that so people have more than five minutes to digest all that. So appreciate yep. the, you having us. Brilliant. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, I can share that for sure. Um, yeah, sorry. I did brief the speakers to have a, a short amount of time each because we've got five speakers. So apologies for that. So we are rushing through a lot of information, but we have plenty of time for debate and discussion. So obviously you can ask questions to the speakers at any time as well after the after the presentations. Um, so I think James Wright from Cooperatives UK is now with us. So James, if you were happy to go next. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Duncan. And thank you for in, inviting us along um, to, to speak to you all today. Um, if, if you don't know who, who Cooperatives UK is, so we're the National Association, UK-wide association of uh, cooperative businesses of all different shapes and sizes. So our members include large consumer cooperatives like, like Scott Mid, um, large ag agricultural cooperatives like First Milk, um, worker-owned cooperatives like Green City and Edinburgh Bicycle Co-op, community-owned cooperatives, uh, cooperatives made up of other businesses, cooperatives made up of other cooperatives, like, you know, we, we represent the full uh, rich um, uh, fabric of, of the cooperative sector in, in Scotland and, uh, and across the UK. Um, my main role is in relation to uh, policy advocacy, but I also... Um, I'm involved in some of our kind of practical development ac activities uh, around the UK as well, some of which obviously working in partnership with with the likes of Cooperative Development Scotland, who obviously do excellent work uh, leading, on, leading on cooperative development in Scotland. Um, so I'm just going to talk first of all just a, a little bit, although um, Stuart has already touched on some of this in terms of what the, the USP of the cooperative model is within the broader kind of social economy uh, context in, in Scotland. And I think there are two, um, can you have two USPs? I, hope, I think you can. Um, two USPs really for, for, for the for the cooperative model within that broader context. Um, one is it, it, it's a vehicle for sharing wealth and power through day-to-day -day business. That's kind of a, a critical aspect of, of by design what, what, what the cooperative model tries to do. So it's about, yes, it's about uh, doing business with purpose, but it's also about um, empowering the beneficiaries of, 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 of that purpose within, within, within the work of the organization so that it's, you're distributing power as well as wealth. I think the second USP, is, is, the cooperative model is, is when it works really well, it's, it's a, a great vehicle for, for facilitating collective action um, to, to address common problems or, or achieve common, common uh, aspirations. So it's, yeah, sharing wealth and power and a vehicle for collective action. Those are the two distinctive things that I think the, that the cooperative model is, is, is intended, uh, intended to do within that broader context of, of the social economy. Um, does it work? Well, I think yes, <laughs> of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think there's increasingly some really good evidence um, coming out that the the cooperative model in all its different uh, shapes and forms is, is is a really effective model for delivering on those, what it's intended to deliver on. There's been some great um, evidence published back end of last year, particularly on relation to worker cooperatives and, and employee-owned businesses that point to re really hard evidence in terms of, for example, the big productivity boost that comes from uh, 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 sharing wealth and power with, with with the workers in an enterprise um likely to uh more likely to have fair pay accreditation gender pay gaps in cooperative businesses are significantly smaller over, on average than, than than in other businesses across the uk 
um, the cooperatives in Scotland on average have more employees than other, than, than, than other businesses in Scotland, so better at creating jobs, but also significantly more resilient as well. So cooperative startups are significantly more likely to survive the first years of trading than um, non-cooperative businesses. But also we've, we've found over the last few years that um, cooperatives are significantly more likely to close down as well um, yeah, than, than businesses at large. And whereas the... Um, Certainly at the UK level, whereas the, the the business population has actually shrunk in the last couple of years, that's that's not true of the of the the cooperative business population. Um, within the specific Scottish context, um, sorry, there's a bit of background noise. Um, turnover in Scotland, one point eight billion combined turnover uh, from about six hundred and twenty one cooperatives. Um, which sounds good, and and it is good, but in the grand scheme of things, it is it is very very small. It's less than one percent of uh, of Scottish businesses are cooperatives by international standards. Uh, you know, the, the cooperative sector in Scotland is small, and actually, although it's growing faster than it is in most parts of the United Kingdom, is is growing relatively slowly as well. So it very much is still you know something of a best kept secret. Um, we have recently done some analysis looking at the. Um, uh, the ratio of of turnover to to GDP um, in, in Scotland and other parts of, and, and and France. So the the ratio of COP turnover to GDP per capita in Scotland is 130 times smaller than it is in France. So like the the French cooperative sector is significantly larger, not just in terms of the number of cooperatives, but also in terms of the the scale of the activity that they undertake. Um, and I think that. Um, you know that that's an important uh, an important insight. There's some great things going on in Scotland, but the, the but the, the potential compared to where we are um, in Scotland and in other parts of the UK. And to if we look to examples where the, you know, the, there's a lot of room for for growth, we're, we're not we're not at the we are not experiencing the the limits of of of, of cooperative potential in, in in Scotland by by any stretch of the imagination. We we could do so much more. Um, Scottish cooperative sector um, significant um, presence in in terms of agriculture. So there's some very large uh, cooperatives comprised of farm businesses in Scotland, um, which is you know significant in their own right, but also play a really critical role in in, in Scottish food and, and farming supply chains, etc. Scottish credit unions tend to be larger than than credit unions in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, a lot of community cooperatives as well. Um, recent trends. Recent trends, uh, formations definitely heading in the right direction, increasing year on year in, in Scotland um, and comparable to other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, formation rates in Scotland are significantly higher. And I do think that is down to the investment that Scottish government has put into cooperative development in Scotland. Having that kind of specialist support for, for cooperative startups in the data makes a significant difference um, to, uh, to, to, to the behavior to activity in, in the economy more people starting cooperatives in scotland and in wales and in other parts of the united kingdom and that's because those devolved nations fund cooperative development in a in a specialist and, and dedicated way it makes a difference um types of cooperative i think the, the biggest growth area by far has been in terms of community co-ops and i think that reflects just where society is and that's where, where the model particularly ad addresses uh, problems at this particular time it's also do to do with uh the success of things like community shares and again scottish government funds community shares scotland which does great work to promote that particular model um and, and that 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 broader context of um community empowerment in scotland and community ownership in scotland that the work that goes on behind that i think just, just has driven a lot of that um we did some analysis of um local authority areas across the country uh, over the last five years and where there have been the most cooperatives set up. But the most cooperatives have been set up in Glasgow, Edinburgh, and I think in the top five Scottish borders it was, it was a, a, also appeared in there as well. So there's definitely, you know, there's, there's good stuff going on in Scotland that like Scotland definitely does lead the way but in terms of the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of cooperative development. But within a context, I think of the potential being much, much bit greater. Um, key stuff that we've been involved with in Scotland at the moment in terms of policy has been this um the inclusive and democratic business models review which scottish government has been running from uh from from last summer until now inclusive and democratic business models and another new term includes uh cooperative social enterprise employing businesses um it's an independent panel um 
you know, which essentially is going to be making recommendations to Scottish governments that for how they could uh, grow all of those, or that the that that combined group of businesses and make them a more significant part of of uh, of Scotland's economy. Um, process from our side, we've we've tried really really hard to uh, involve our our members, cooperatives in Scotland, to make sure they have they've been able to have a voice in that process in lieu of any uh, public consultation from Scottish government itself. Um, that's been really useful i think really really valuable i think it's really changed i think actually that what we thought our priorities would be going into the into the process or clarified them in different ways um i think the recommendations that will go into scottish government um around really ambitious around you know that levels of uh the, the level of growth that they should aim for in terms of inclusive and democratic businesses and in terms of some of the specific challenges that need to be addressed around things like awareness and understanding of these models, the frequency with which these models are explored by potential social entrepreneurs or when businesses are changing ownership, when communities are coming together and uh, looking at their their problems, et cetera. Um, Great recommendations on things like capital, um, uh, the nature of business support in Scotland, et cetera. Um, I suppose my big a concern, I think, at this point is this implementation gap. So the recommendations will go into Scottish Government. One, there's not necessarily, those are just recommendations by an independent panel. It's then for Scottish Government to decide what they do with those recommendations, whether they accept them or not. And even after that, if they say, yes, we're going to do some of these things, there's then the the challenge, I think, of of, of that being implemented in a way which is, which is, which is actually effective. And some of that, I think, comes down to things like the the, the budgetary environment and at the moment of the Scottish government continues to cut funding generally for um for uh enterprise agencies etc which just makes the, any any uh, any recommendations we make around you know more resource going into supporting inclusive and democratic businesses it's it's it, it, it's there's I think there are some there will be some challenges to to deliver on, on on these ambitions but I think there are challenges that will will always be there to be honest and I think our job is just to continue to make the case for why that money would be better spent um, supporting this type of economy than the, an extractive uh, economy that um, doesn't deliver for for, for you know, workers, communities, and, and the environment. Um, that's what we'll be trying to do. Um, I think there are big opportunities, but I think obviously some some challenges as well. I think um, I'll leave it there. Sorry about the background noise beforehand. It's okay. It's the background noise is never as bad as people think. <laughs> um, no, thanks, James. I really appreciate that. So I think it's good for us to get those diff- three different perspectives, which are really strategic perspectives, um, and really kind of policy perspectives before we go to the kind of grassroots um, um, cooperative. I was going to say social enterprise there. Uh, our grassroots cooperative movement. Um, I suppose it's also worth mentioning there is a cooperative CPG as well, which um, myself and my colleague Andy have attended uh, quite recently as well. And there is a bit of a work um for the cpg around housing cooperatives which i think we're really supportive of which is a really important topic at the moment obviously with the with the housing crisis um i think that's a really important point james made around the implementation gap as well so as as he mentioned the the nset um, review group which we've been a member of as well um has been producing this report which i think is quite an exciting report quite radical quite ambitious um but it is that kind of will the scottish government take on board all these recommendations and actually implement them and that's a that's a case with any review or any piece of legislation really it's that implementation gap which i think is something that you know many organizations i think are really noticing um so for example the community wealth building legislation which is coming up relatively soon um you know we we are you know, everyone has concerns around it. will that be implemented practically in communities and how do we do that and how do communities really benefit? So it's, a, it's an ongoing issue for, for many organisations which we're aware of. Um, so, yeah, so as I said, we have that strategic policy perspective. So it's good to get some kind of grassroots perspectives now from, from a couple of cooperatives operating in Scotland. So we have Gloria Dawson from Research for Action. If you'd like to go next, Gloria. Cool. Thanks a lot. Lot, Duncan, and um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my own co-op, which is quite actually quite unusual and definitely unusual in terms of the framework of, of social businesses and co-ops which we're talking about today. And then I'll talk a little bit about the broader context in Glasgow and how we've been um, sort of self-organising as co-ops in, in Glasgow. Um, so, so Research for Action is a Zworth co-op. We were formally founded in 2017 and we're a company limited by guarantee, which is pretty normal. Um, and we're a member of Co-ops UK and we're also a member of the Worker Co-op Federation, which is um, a more recent 
development in co-op, uh, development, solidarity, and you know, building relationships. Um, so we are a research co-op. So we produce research and kind of interventions in the field of um, information rights, democracy, and especially with relationship to citizens and local governments and how those two things, those two kind of groups interact. Um, so our work came out of um, looking at unsustainable debt um, in uh, local authorities and uh, particularly like the loan regimes in local authorities that were crippling them financially. And then we've moved into more looking at things like um, form, different forms of financial accountability, including audits. And we've also we've been part of the European Municipalist Network. So we're quite linked in, in terms of other groups in different countries. And um, that's involved um, mainly on our end, promoting different models of radical democracy in different cities, um, notably places like Zagreb, Barcelona, and also Italian cities where there are people from the grassroots trying to radically reorientate the relationships between citizens and the local state. Um, so we, we kind of, in terms of actually like the substance of our work, there's a lot of overlap with what co-ops are and, and the cooperative ethos. So it made sense as a research collective to, to constitute ourselves as a co-op. So um, uh, I'll just briefly touch on kind of in terms of like our, how we're funded. We're not, we're not a business. We would mainly um, dependent on grant funding. And so we've been largely funded by two, um, two trusts and foundations in the last few years of our work um, and there's only three of us so we're like a very very small group of people um, so we chose to be a co-op because we were obviously kind of politically committed to the idea of like worker control and um, having being in charge of our own work and um, being able to uh, control the direction of the organization we felt like the cooperative model um, the sort of seven cooperative principles are an ethos which help um, both kind of solidify your principles and values, but also allow you to change and grow as an organization. So we're not wedded to always being a three person research co-op. Um, we we look, we do a lot of collaborations with other people and um, we're open to becoming a different kind of um, kind of working group of people. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, which maybe won't isn't emphasized so much is that, I think there's a for all of us there's quite an important aspect about what being a worker means in terms of how we care for each other and how we take care of our own health and well-being so for us it's really important to be able to write our own um, human resources and kind of policies and approaches to things like um, well-being and sick pay and we we try and basically allow ourselves to be as healthy as possible in the society that we live in. Um, and so that means that we have written a sick pay policy that gives us you know, proper wages when we're sick, um, that allows us to work flexibly. I currently have a broken wrist um, and we've kind of changed the way we work together because we all work remotely anyway um, to kind of accommodate the fact that I basically can't type. Um, and that just feels like actually so easy in, a, in an organization where we all kind of have ethos of kind of care and, and responsibility. And um, some of the challenges of being in a co-op I wanted to touch on are um, having to do everything ourselves, <laughs> even though there's a lot of support and a lot of information out there, being your own um, HR, payroll, um, policy management, um, fundraising, et cetera, it can be quite draining and quite stressful for, for a small team. Um, and especially understanding the tax and the pay models, we found really difficult, and we spent quite a long time because it felt like quite a drain on our on our resources. Um, and also just working remotely, which isn't a particularly co-op thing, but I do think there are some quite a lot of co-ops who work in this model, and I'm going to touch on some of them when I talk about the general Glasgow picture. Um, so the grassroots grassroots perspective from Glasgow, I would say that there's been a move in the last um, year or so. Um, to really rebuild Glasgow as a cooperative city. Um, and that's kind of been led by just a few people in very different co-ops. So people who work for Green City, which is the Whole Foods Co-op, um, which is quite a large organization, quite well established. Um, the Media Co-op, which is a long running um, media production um, and content organization. And then like smaller co-ops in the city like mine. Um, so the kind of the key people who are involved in it are in work in media, design, um, facilitation, 
cleaning, there's a cleaners co-op, there's talk of a therapist co-op being set up. So we really do work across the range of kind of businesses, services and interests, but there are so many overlaps and alignments. And I've been surprised actually at like, because we have a monthly social. So one of the main reasons we connect, way we connect with each other, we try and spend time with each other on a monthly basis. And then we generate ideas and projects from that, from that group. Um, and so some of the things we're working on at the moment are um, a kind of co-op workspace experiment. So in the, the media co-op um, offices, there are now four different co-ops, including my own, working out of those offices and sharing time and workspace together. And it's just so important to be able to like have water cooler moments with each other and um, connect informally. And that's giving rise to lots of like really good thoughts and ideas. Um, we're having like fun events and trips. So we had a Christmas visit to the Cooperative Archive in um, Kelvin Hall to kind of really understand what the what the immense um, cooperative history of the city is and what the immense cooperative potential in the future is. Um, we're also trying to get city councillors and businesses more interested in co-ops in Glasgow. So we're holding an event on the 25th of June to showcase Glasgow's co-ops and the co-op potential in the city. And um, we're also kind of, knocking around this idea of having a basically a building and a space for the co-op movement in the city and that would ideally at the moment uh, involve offices and workspaces but also potentially housing as well um, which is very ambitious but I think that something that we all share and has been touched on by previous speakers is the visibility of cooperatives as an option and as a, as a, pos a real possibility for people who maybe are more like CIC social enterprises or thinking their way into that sector it's still quite marginal and I don't think it has to be that way um, and I think it requires requires visibility and dedication and obviously support um, to kind of grow that so my my hopes for the future are that we have a permanent cooperative space in Glasgow for the for the movement um, I hope that I want more groups and businesses in Glasgow to operate successfully uh, as co-ops and, and and beyond I would say we've also been doing things in in, in Argyll and also all over the place um, and also that more people know about co-ops. That's that's just a, like a simple aspiration. And personally, I'd like to have like a stable income and a and a and a life in, in the cooperative movement for the for the longer term, um, because I think that's really important. So yeah, that's me, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Gloria. That's really, really useful. And I think it's really important about kind of building that infrastructure and that support for cooperatives and the, the cooperative movement as well. Um, so our final speaker is Ali Tibbet from The Ferret, if you'd like to go ahead, Ali. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm conscious that you've already listened to lots of people speaking, so I'll try to be brief and make space for um, conversations. Um, I am one of the founding co-directors of The Ferret, which is a um, an investigative media cooperative. Um, it was founded in 2015 with a grant from Cooperatives UK. Uh, back in the day, our who ran a small grant scheme, and our we're still members of Cooperatives UK. Our sister cooperative, if you like, is the Bristol Cable, who also got a grant from the same scheme down down south. Um, we do have slightly different cooperative models, though, and it's probably worth digging into that. Um, we deliberately. Uh, held off launching um, until the Scottish independence referendum um, had passed us. And you may remember there was a fairly fevered atmosphere in the media around that time. Um, I should make it clear that um, the ferret is non-partisan and has no opinion on deliberately on uh, whether Scotland should be independent or not. Uh, and we, we waited to launch uh, because we everything was so polarised at that time. Um, and uh, the model that we adopted reflects is actually a response to that kind of polarization that we saw in the media and in politics at that time, which is arguably continued through Brexit and all the rest of it. So the model that we have um, is what's called a multi-stakeholder cooperative, um, which I don't think has quite come up yet. Um, traditionally, people think of cooperatives as either workers' cooperatives or as community benefit cooperatives, um, broadly speaking. Um, the, the difference being, of course, that the workers own the cooperative or the customers own the cooperative. Um, in the fair, we, a multi, the multi-stakeholder cooperative model that we have is a mixture of both of those things. So we have two different kinds of directors. We have journalist directors uh, who are elected from the journalist members. 
uh, and uh, you become a journalist member if you have produced more than three stories for the ferret uh, and uh, you you know you apply for membership uh, however what one of the key things that we wanted to do to differentiate ourselves and I suppose it's worth mentioning that when we were thinking about this model we were actually advised by an independent consultant who uh, will remain nameless not to initially um, cons uh, um, launch as a cooperative and just to set up as a company registered by guarantee but we were really clear that we actually wanted this model as a as a USP in the media space. Um, back at that time, there was almost no media which had a paywall. It's amazing how quickly things have changed when I look back on it. Um, we were the, you know, we had a paywall. And what we wanted to say to people was, you know, investigative journalism is under threat. Um, all the main large corporate news organizations are owned by private equity, often from far away. Uh, it's very extractive, actually. Um, the the interests of those owners may not represent the interests of local people. If you want uh, public interest journalism that's good, that's high quality, and that serves your interests, then if you invest in this, not only do you become a subscriber with sort of passive recipient of information, you become a part owner of the business, and you can stand for election as a reader director and help set the priorities of the organisation uh, along with the journalists. Uh, we also have independent directors to bring in extra skills. Um, and, you know, we started off with that one and a half thousand pound grant from Copters UK. These days, we're still a pretty small organization. So we have a turnover of around two or three hundred thousand pounds every year. Um, approximately. Um, approximately. Uh, two fifths of the money comes from our subscribers. We have about two thousand, just over two thousand paying members. We have uh, a good chunk of cash comes from grants. Um, and then we have about 10% of our money comes from content sales to other media organizations. So we still work very closely, for example, with NewsQuest and, uh, and other organizations, you know, other media organizations. We've worked with the BBC in the past, for example, in co-productions. Um, but the important thing to us is uh, that we built a, we built in at the start a governance model um, and an organization which can't be taken over um, and will always serve, you know, the interest, serve, balance the interests, if you like, of readers and journalists to produce public interest news. Um, and I think we've been reasonably successful on that front. Um, you know, it was an experiment. We weren't sure where it was going to go in 20, 2015. It's still, the fact that it still exists is is a, is, is testament to all the, the sweat equity that we've put into it. I think some of the challenges that um, Gloria mentioned, I would echo that, um, I think when we were setting up, we had a little bit of difficulty because cooperatives are kind of secret secret model, if you like, even just dealing with things like online payment providers um, who didn't have a category for a cooperative. We had to explain to them what they what we were <laughs> when we were trying to set up to take direct debit payments, for example. Um, um, you know, and again, we've had, you know, managing HR properly and fairly and effectively in a, in a, in a way has taken it's been a bit of a journey for us um you know we've actually ended up outsourcing that because we, we found it much easier just to outsource that so that we could focus on the journalism um the but you know we, that said we do feel like we've built a sustainable foundation for public interest news journalism one of the we are at, one of the interesting things is i suppose is that we have concluded now that everybody else is requiring you know there's a there's a subscription Everybody now is asking for subscriptions uh, for the media. And um, one of the things that we've realized is that we're probably going to rely on institutional funding, as in philanthropy, for, for, for as, as a part of the model for a lot longer than we anticipated. And um, so we're now trying to work out how we can slightly com convert our model to bring in a charitable structure into that um and one of the things i would be saying to nathan is it's very difficult it's surprisingly difficult now to convert a community benefit society into sorry a registered society into a charitable community benefit society without breaking everything as it were um and it'd be very good if the law could be amended so that we could we could do that <laughs> um there's also more of a movement in the, in recent years to uh we've been for example part of a a working group uh, looking at setting up public interest news as a charitable purpose in its own right. 
Um, and we are, so we're looking at actually building in a sort of semi-detached separate, setting up a semi-detached separate charity uh, and modifying our cooperative, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperative to reserve a place on the board for a director of the charity so that there's a much, it's not the traditional charitable um, trading subsidiary set up, but it's uh, there's still in a sort of a link between the two organizations. And uh, and again, the multi-stakeholder cooperative model will be hopefully flexible enough to accommodate that kind of journey that we're going on. Uh, and I think that's probably something that's worth taking away and thinking about is that, you know, you can uh, set up a model which can, can accommodate, you know, different, you know, diff a, a, a really diverse set of stakeholders into the governance of an organization, which would otherwise be really difficult to, otherwise I think be really difficult to do in any other corporate um, structure. Uh, and on that note, I should probably shut up and open the floor or leave the chair to open the floor to questions. Well, good, thanks, Ali. Um, so I think we've got some, yeah, really um, diverse perspectives there, I think. So obviously from the support and the policy perspectives plus the grassroots perspective. Um, so I know there's a lot of information there. <laughs> and again, it was my briefing to kind of get get five speakers and get them to speak in a short, sharp way. So I know there's a lot of information, a lot of a lot of things to think about there, a lot of food for thought. Um, so I'm aware there's a lot of questions been posted in the chat, which I think our speakers have actually been answering. So I really appreciate that. So thank you for that. So um yeah does anybody want to put their hand up just now we've got um about 15 minutes for questions and discussion um les do you want to go first you seem to unmute sorry we muted everybody on entry sorry sorry can you all see me and hear me okay yep just <laughs> just to prove that we got broadband in the middle of scotland um can i say first of all that we ought to be very grateful for social enterprise scotland and the other organizations for doing this this morning. This is a discussion which, quite honestly, is long overdue. Can I be a bit controversial, though? I think we're trying to create a false distinction between co-ops and social enterprises, because the majority of co-ops are, in fact, registered as companies limited by guarantee. So to me, it's never been, it's never been a, a sort of root and branch distinction between co-ops and social enterprises. For me, the key thing is democratic control. And that's the kind of thing that Gloria was talking about. That's the kind of thing that Adrian Ashton, who's in the list, was talking about. If we can get democratic control, quite honestly, I've never been that fussed about whether it's a company limited by guarantee or a co-op or even, dare I say, a community interest company, as long as we've got democratic control. But the thing that also worries me, I don't know where Stuart and others are getting their figures from, if you have a look at the FCA Mutuals Public Register, what Ian Adderley has done now with the FCA Register is to make available a CSV table of those organisations which are registered or claim to be registered as co-ops. And quite honestly, once you strip out the working men's clubs and once you take out the housing co-ops and things like that, there is in fact a very small number of organisations that call themselves co-ops. And for me, because I'll be told not to keep going on, where, where the action is coming from, it's coming from people like Gloria, it's coming from the Worker Co-ops Federation, it's coming from Louise Scott at the Media Co-op, it's coming from the organisations on the ground, it's coming, for example, from sites like Lumio and the Co-op Development Forum. That's where the action is coming from. And one final thing, I wish James Proctor had been here this morning because the most memorable event in co-ops for me took place about four years ago when James Pro Proctor, and don't ask me where he got the funding from, brought together co-ops people from the north of Ireland, from Scotland, from Wales and for England. That to me was a very, very illustrative session, but I'll end as I began. The real action and the real thrust, if I may say so, isn't coming from any of the so-called representative organizations it's coming from the people on the ground and by the way ali i'm a ferret subscriber as well i depend on you thanks les um yeah i think i think that point about um cooperatives being part of the social enterprise movement absolutely i think we agree with that certainly we, we, we always say that that most cooperatives are, are social enterprises absolutely yeah. it's just it's just really examining different aspects of the social enterprise community i think and today we're just having that real 
um, focus on cooperatives really. So, um, but yeah, I think I think it's good as well that we've been coming together more with the cooperative organisations as well as social enterprise, um, you know, support organisations as well. So around the NSET review, which James had mentioned, um, we have been reviewing cooperatives employer-owned businesses and social enterprises, all those democratically owned models that you mentioned. I think we have been bringing those together in this review, which is really important. Um, and I think going forward, we're certainly going to be working closer with with those different um, representative bodies for those organizations, as well as the grassroots cooperatives, certainly as well. So I've um, got a hand raised there. Do you want to just come in? Um, sorry, I don't want to speak over anybody else. If that's fine, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So just a very quick question. Uh, honestly, you mentioned that uh, it's it's about the democratic control in cooperatives, whether it is a kick or whether it is a different form of social entrepreneurship. Um, I'm not sure if there is a democratic control when we talk about a community interest company or a company limited by guarantee. Uh, and, and that is a huge difference between the two. They fall on the same spectrum of social entrepreneurship but uh, they don't, uh, they're not the same thing. So that was just one of the things I was going to say. The other thing I had uh, in my mind was from a funding aspect. So cooperatives and mutuals have this challenge, a bigger challenge than most social enterprises do of finding funding uh, uh, because it is a membership model. Often the money is coming in from this membership model. And um, and and I think that is one of, a, one of the bigger challenges they face, you know, um, anyways, most social enterprise face funding challenges, but their legal structure by itself is quite complicated to accept, I don't know, grant funding or, 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 you know, to go to funders who give money specifically to CLGs most of the time. So just just curious, how does how do people within the sector feel from a funding point of view? How does that work for them? Um, so, James, do you want to come back on any of those points that have just been raised and then we'll maybe go to the other speakers to come back on any of those points as well? Yeah, um, sure. Um, so, in terms of like uh, kicks and companies limited by guarantee and shares, um, so it's not the default that those are governed in a democratic way, but it is definitely possible to write things into the articles which which, which turn them into into democratically governed businesses, democratically and controlled businesses. So you, you can almost hack the legal forms, if you like, to, to make them uh, to make them democratic, to, to make them cooperatives. It's just it's just not a default option. There's a bit of extra work. And I suppose the distinction is whereas the society legal forms have been were created and evolved explicitly to 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 enable that that approach to business and the other legal kicks and companies um haven't been, but you can still you can still make them work that way if, if that's what you want them to do. Um, on the capital side, I think it's it's a little bit more nuanced. I think some types of um, cooperative actually enable forms of capital raising better than than other types of social enterprise. Particularly, I think if you look at something like uh, the community cooperative model, community shares. What you're really doing there is by by having a <clears throat> by creating a a vehicle, an entity which shares ownership and control with a broader group of people with the with the people who have a stake in what the the cooperative is trying to do, and then inviting them to to contribute capital, you can actually crowdfund uh, equity, patient, mission aligned equity from a from a, a broader a group of people than you might otherwise be able to do. So I think there are some there are ways in using the cooperative model um, to to actually to to raise capital in in, in more effective ways. But yeah, for, for some types of uh, for some types of cooperative, there there are definitely challenges they're not insurmountable i think it is possible if you look around the world for um for for example worker cooperatives to bring in some additional investment from from the outside as long as it's done very very carefully in order to protect ownership and control um it's 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 not it's not an insurmountable hurdle um it, it does it does happen for sure um, i think there are also just some challenges around particularly in the funding space different types of um Grant maker, um, uh, public and 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 an NGO, not necessarily always understanding the distinctions between some of the different legal forms, and therefore that drawing their eligibility criteria in, in ways which are unnecessary, and that 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 excludes some types of some model or doesn't appreciate them or understand them fully. That those are definitely uh, challenges for sure. Thanks, James. Um, Ali, do you want to come in on any of those points raised? Yeah, I mean, I think just to comment on the funding, the funding issue, I mean, I think, um, you know, if you want, if you know, I suppose my advice to anybody thinking about this stuff is that, you know, if you know that you're going to have a significant uh, 
need for institutional grant funding or philanthropic funding going forwards, you know, as part of your model, then I, I would, you know, I, th I think you need to think quite carefully about whether you can build a charitable, you know, you can have a charitable cooperative in various different guises. Um, so the, the, if you like the, you know, the challenge that we there are two challenges that the ferret has faced practically if you like one is that there is very little charitable funding available in the uk for um public interest news um uh, there isn't a culture of philanthropic giving towards public interest news anyway in the uk whether we were a cooperative or a charity and in fact our biggest our biggest most significant funding comes from philanthropic sources in the us um so you know there's some big you know there's a there's a there's a us um, there's a culture in the US of supporting public interest news around the world, uh, but particularly in the, in, in the US. So, uh, you know, we the biggest grants we've had have actually come from the US via sometimes via charitable sponsor, sometimes directly. Um, and really, we you know, one of the reasons we were looking at setting up a, you know, a charitable body of a, that is more closely linked to what we do is simply because um, simply because we, you know, we don't want to have to work through those kind of complicated sort of charitable sponsor bodies to get to get access to that kind of cash. Um, that said, I would echo, you know, so I suppose, you know, if the, if I have a plea, if you like, to, um, to representative bodies, uh, one of them would be, you know, there's a bit of work being done already through, um, for example, the Public Interest News Foundation down, down south, which is really working quite hard to promote that um, culture of, philanthropic support for for news in particular but also i think there's something to be said for you know reassuring grant you know traditional grant givers that it's okay to give money to cooperatives because they also have you know they most of them have a social purpose or at least as you know not to rule them out completely now obviously you know when it comes to workers co-ops it's a slightly different situation for example but you know i think uh rather you know one of the, again one of the reasons that we are looking at setting up this sort of slightly detached charitable organization is because we recognize that in scotland in particular some of the big institutional funders you know the likes of your robertson trusts and, and what have you uh are unlikely to give money to a cooperative at the moment and you know we could spend a lot of time trying to persuade them to do that but it's much easier just to set up a ski or something <laughs> so that we you know so that we don't have to play that game um you know, um, and it would be nice if there was a bit of work to be done there just to sort of say it's OK. It's OK to give money to cooperatives. Don't panic uh, to some of those institutional funders to make the case because uh, we can't really do it on our own, I think, um, whereas uh, there may be other organisations which have a bit of clout that can affect that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that issue of funding and finances, you know, comes up in every conversation we have. It came up a lot in the conversation at the CPG last night in Scottish Parliament, that's the social enterprise CPG. Um, so we also it came up in the conversation with our MSP we, we met with this morning as well. So, um, Stuart, would you like to come in on any of those points? Yeah, I'm just, I mean, I voted, <laughs> I voted with my feet a little bit. Uh, I haven't come from the, the, you know, the philanthropic grant grant funder side of things you know there's there's huge interest from philanthropic funders around alleviating poverty you know that isn't unique to one grant funder um a lot of the work that they support do that and the irony is actually if they want to get upstream and they want to um fund some of that big change that lasts they need to get closer to private sector businesses and actually change you know some of the stuff that glory was talking about is exactly to the heart of this around working practices flexible working fair pay better conditions mental health support these are all things that need to change in the private sector and actually for me the opportunity to do something around awareness of the cooperative model is really important so softly gently ali having some of those conversations with funders where i've, I've still got those connections and networks um but you know a huge opportunity, you know, in Scotland um, to, to do more. I think, you know, on, on Leslie's uh, point, I've been with the team for a year and a half. There's lots of work going on just now around raising awareness within local authorities and business advisors to try and make sure people are aware of cooperatives as a business model. But you're right, I think it's fantastic the work that's being done, particularly in Glasgow, um, around cooperatives coming together to, to raise awareness and, and do it for themselves, which is part of the cooperative principle. So it's fantastic to see such fertile ground to be able to promote the cooperative model and some of the benefits of it. So. Great, thanks, Stuart. I um, just want to see if Gloria or Nathan wanted to add anything in terms of any of those points as speakers. Well, 
I, I, I just started typing and then realized that typing is a really useless thing for me to do. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize, and I know that we said this when we met with you in, in Glasgow a few months back, you know, that, and, and all the co-ops around the table were saying this, you know, we've all had really terrible experiences of work. Like we've actually, as workers, we've all had experiences of being like exploited, um, undermined, not cared for, and and that we want to actually make work into something different. So I think that I think that's something that's really important to emphasize. And I don't know how much that will come through in the way that the Scott Gov recommendations play out or anything. But I actually, just, I think it makes for me it makes cops more appealing to like the the person on the street, the person in the bus, to say. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if like work was better? Wouldn't it be great if people were given a fair wage for what they do? Wouldn't it be great if we could like choose our own hours? Like so many people want that, you know? And I think we could talk about work like that and not just always say, oh, we've got to defend you know, the co-op movement or the social enterprise movement. But it's absolutely obvious why these models are good. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, a, there's so much overlap in terms of the different policy agendas as well, not just between, you know, cooperatives as part of the wider social enterprise movement, but also the fair work agenda as well. So we're immersed in the kind of fair work agenda and we, what that means, a payment, the real living wage, um, employee voice, obviously hugely important for cooperatives. So there's a lot of, lot of overlap there, I think, as well. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Nathan, before we move on. No, I'm good. Just uh, put a note in the chat. Um, so I'm sort of in listening okay. marriage, but... You know, our, our job is to make sure the legal form works. So uh, if you've got any, if you've got any complaints, let us know. <laughs> but we're on the case. Perfect. Thanks. Um, Fabio, would you like to come in just now? Yeah. Th thank you for organising this, and thank you to the speakers. I'm, I'm particularly interested. Um, was a bit distracted by uh, Gloria's great points about the, uh, you know, the, the having um, proper good work. Uh, so yeah, absolutely behind you on that. But um, I'm particularly interested in seeing whether the COP uh, model can help uh, address um, some some real market failures. Um, we, we're investigating a kind of food producers COP and I'm told that in France, I mean, um, food producer cops are actually great rivals for supermarkets and they and, and fight that corner very well. And they, um, also we are aware that the kind of car share um, kind of organizations, we have a great one here uh, at the moment and it's on its way out. Um, insurance becomes impossible to sustain costs, uh, add up. The sense of shared ownership between the members isn't what it was when the organization was very small. So that organization is going to stop. Um, and yet those are uh, both things are really important uh, given the, the kind of climate and nature emergency that we uh, are facing. Um, so just if just a plea, if anybody knows of either uh, food producers cops or uh, car sharing cops um, that are working as a model and um, can, can address some of that market failure, it'd be great, great to hear. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Fabio. Um, so it is midday just now, but I'm happy to continue the conversation for another few minutes. If other people would like to do that as well, obviously you can leave anytime you like, um, but we can continue for another five or 10 minutes if that's okay. I'm not sure if our speakers have got other meetings to go to or anything, but um, so James, would you like to go next? Yeah, just to, to respond to Fabio. I mean, so if, if by food producers, you 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 mean farmers essentially um and then uh, then yeah that's that, there's already some significant um uh cooperatives comprised of farmers in Scotland so one some the largest cooperatives in, in Scotland are, are, are farmer cooperatives um across different sectors um you know livestock arable um some some that operate on the kind of on the kind of the input farm input side some that are on in terms of like increasing productivity and innovation on farm and some that are involved in kind of trying to uh capture more value downstream so it does more of the processing collective negotiation with with the supermarkets etc um but i think uh, and scotland is, is definitely better than the rest of the united kingdom when it comes to the scale and impact of, of farmer cooperation but it's still well short of what it is in yeah other advanced countries i think when we if you look at it, france is a, it would be a great example like the the role that farmer cooperation plays in uh, in france and other parts of europe is significantly greater than it is in uh it is in in the uk um, i think that's one of the reasons but not the only reason why why the um 
well, there's there are so many problems and balances between um, food producers and, uh, uh, and the retail sector for for, for sure. Um, that, so there are opportunity, there are definitely big opportunities to grow to grow that model in the UK and in Scotland because it's it's it is a, again a more significant component of the the food system in, in other countries. That's for sure. I can give you some examples if you want. I could send you a, yeah. Yeah, very good. Anybody else got any any further questions or want to respond to any of the points raised so far? Oh, we may have reached a natural conclusion on time. Les, go for it, yeah. Yeah, if, well, first of all, Duncan, thanks again to Social Enterprise Scotland for doing this. Um, I would still like to think that we could resurrect the formula that James Proctor did about four or five years ago when he got together the co-op representative organisations from North of Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England. Now, for many of us, that was a very productive session. We were able to compare notes. We were able to discuss things on the ground. Now, quite honestly, I, I haven't got the time to do it. I haven't got the funding for doing it, but I hope that somebody will have a look at that. I feel like I should leave James to respond to that. <laughs> um, yeah, let's let, let's let's take it. Let's take a look at it when the after this review. I would say with Scottish government is out of the way because that's definitely our priority at the moment. But yeah, that'd be an opportunity to revisit that for sure. Yeah, and I, th I think that review again, just to mention it again, I think is really important that we are bringing together these three distinct, you know, kind of business models. Obviously, as you said, many cooperatives are part of the social enterprise movement anyway. But um, around this kind of label, which we're not sure if we like or not, called IDBM, you know, inclusive democratic business models, to coin another phrase, um, and and other types of business models, ethical business models as well. So I think it's quite good for us, as I mentioned, going forward to kind of work in that vein. Actually, so um, would anybody? like to make any final points or raise any final questions before we wind up again I'll, we'll send around an email with a lot of these resources um after this webinar as well um, and i'll share the speaker's email addresses if that's okay unless you really don't want us to do that <laughs> um and obviously the presentation slides um as well uh, fabio would you like to come in uh, just a techie question um, i used to be able to save um the chat but i um, somebody can just let me know how to do that in the future. It'd be great. I'm not sure where that button is going. Um, yeah, I think it automatically saves when we close. I can maybe try and I'll, I think the file just saves, so I can maybe email the file for that as well. I think Thank you. our settings. I'll stay online and speak to my colleagues about that before I end the session. Thank <laughs> you. I'm, I'm looking at Andy actually, but. <laughs> um, Excellent. Yes. So yeah, we'll send a list of resources and obviously anything else you've got to share with the attendees today, please just email me ideally today because we'll try and get the email out today, I think. So um, anybody else got any final points? Before Kim we... will show you how to do the chat, Duncan. She did it for me. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Um... No. Well, thanks very much for coming along today. A really big thanks to our speakers. I think that was a really valuable session. I know that I did brief you to speak very quickly. <laughs> I only gave you a few minutes. We had more speakers than usual, I think. So we had did our five speakers. Um, but I think that's just a really good mix, a really good diversity of voices there um, in terms of the different you know, perspectives from from in terms of the cooperative movement. So obviously as I mentioned policy strategy and grassroots. I think that's that's really vital to get that. And again, we'll work you know with Cooperatives UK and others to kind of bring forward more more webinars hopefully around this topic in future. So thanks everybody and have a good day. <laughs>